Hey, hey, y'all. The show starts in 30 seconds. And welcome to the Tito Bonito Show. Tonight, we have Silver Lake Neighborhood Councilwoman, maybe a girl, and fitness expert and contortionist extraordinaire, Christina Nakaya. And now, give it up for your host, the Cuban Missile Crisis of Burlesque himself, Tito Bonito! What's up, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Tito Bonito Show. It is hot as fuck today in Los Angeles, so we are going to leave that air conditioner on. But welcome, welcome. I am so excited for everyone that is joining us today. Uh, we have a jam-packed show that I feel like is going to be super fun, super uh, inspirational, but also informative, and hopefully a lot of fun. So I hope you guys stick around through the whole thing. It's a cute hour long tonight. We have the first drag queen ever elected to public office. Maybe a girl is joining us, and I'm so excited to find out more about her and you know just talk politics because that is something right now that people are super nervous about doing, and it's something that we have to be doing in order to enact the change that we want to see in the world and for a lot of people they don't believe that change can happen so i'm very excited to have positive words but also realistic approaches to creating the change that we need to see in the world because we need it now arguably more than ever y'all uh we also have christina nikaya who is a uh, cubanita and i'm very excited one of the first people that i met on my journey into moving to los angeles in the burlesque scene i met her in new york and I have fallen in love with her. She is so inspirational, so strong, so beautiful. And on top of that, she's just multi-talented. So I'm very excited as well to have her on the show. I do want to shout out, if you want to support me, make sure you check out the link in my bio. There are multiple ways that you can do that. Also, I will be sharing all of the guests' Venmos today. So please, if you like what you see, if anything struck a chord with you, Venmo them, tip them some motherfucking dollars, uh, and then let them know what you liked watching about them in the show tonight. Also, since there is nobody that can actively cheer and do some shit so that I can hear that you all are enjoying what you are seeing, if you like what you're seeing today, please make sure to put the heart emoji as much as you want whenever you're feeling so inclined to do so. And if you have any questions for any of the guests tonight, there is a question mark box right on the bottom that you can type in and I will get to it if I can. And if the question is stupid, I will call you out. So uh, let's get started with our first guest. Our first guest is a uh, originally from Pittsburgh, but I'm going to talk about their uh, journey through the United of States. They are a drag queen and Silver Lake neighborhood councilwoman. They were also came to prominence not only as an amazing drag queen, but a producer in the Los Angeles community and uh, was the first ever drag queen ever to be elected to public office. So any further ado, I'm going to bring to your screens, maybe a girl. Hey. Hey. How are Hi, you? Gorge Hi, gorgeous. How are you doing? Good. I miss you. It's been so long. I know I miss you too. You are actually the first show that got me out of my quarantine blues that I performed for online. Yes, I live for that. So you know, I, I, haven't, I haven't done a show in a while. I feel like I was really into it at the beginning, but um, you know, I feel like it's there's just something a little depressing about like you know performing in your living room. <laughs> it's live. Now it was it was more fun when we uh, didn't have to do it live like i like the idea of pre-recording stuff mm -hmm. uh but the actual live part i think it took me a while to kind of get into it and i remember when i was doing your show i woke up and i was like i don't want to do this today yeah. i just don't and i was like i can and the minute i put on the outfit and the pasties i was like oh i'm ready like i'm ready totally i know i'm the same way i'm like i've been like oh i don't want to like put on the makeup i don't want to start getting ready but like once i'm like doing it once the wig goes out i'm like okay this was worth it this is fun so and and it's and that's the the worst part about it is knowing that it's always worth it. Like even bad shows, like it is always just worth to have fun, enjoy the fact that we have the liberties to do that. 
Exactly. But that doesn't mean that we can't take a break from it every once in a while and just kind of like recharge our batteries, so to speak. Totally. Um, you, I want to find out as much as I can about you because I've been doing my research, but I want to talk to you like homies. So this is totally like ah. a normal conversation. I'm turning off the comments so everyone can just see your face. Yeah. Um, but you, there's a couple things that I wanted to talk about, but you grew up in Pittsburgh, am I right? Yes. Well, I was born in Pittsburgh and I lived there till I was nine. And then my family moved to Chicago when I was nine. So I pretty much grew up. I like came of age, if you will, in Chicago. And that's the part that I loved because that is the same story for me. Even though I grew up in Miami, I came of age in Chicago. And then I heard in one of your interviews that you were actually running or wanting to run for the mayor of Chicago. Yes, I'm surprised that you heard that or that you found out. Well, I was honestly, the thing was to the time frame that you said that you were doing it. Uh, and the only reason, of course, that you didn't get it was just because, you know, we weren't as awaken at that moment but it was really amazing to hear how much support you had because if i had known i would have been cheering your ass on because you were doing that when i lived there just before i left thank you yeah i think that was that was a while ago i think that was in like 2012 yeah and, and the reason i considered running for that it was you know a little outlandish of course but you know i've always been interested in um just civic engagement and um you know just getting involved with community and so I was like, why not? Let's try it. I tried to get on the ballot. Unfortunately, we didn't qualify for the ballot. So we ended up getting, I think, around like 1,200 signatures. But we needed like 12,000 signatures to get on the ballot. And there was like a really short, um, you know, period of time, a short window to actually do that. So it didn't happen. And um, I guess I can put my political endeavors on, on hold for a minute at that point. <laughs> so did you, uh, how long did it take for you to move to Los Angeles? Was that something that you always wanted to do? Or was that something that kind of just life put in your path? You know, it kind of just happened. Um, my really good friend, Izzy Ashi, um, she, uh, we've been best friends for like, probably like 15 years now. And we were both living in Chicago. And my friend was just like, I'm moving to LA. And I was like, all right, um, I'll help you drive there. And so I started taking trips to LA. And I just fell in love with the city. I. Um, you know, made every excuse I could just to make my way out here. And at one point, I was just like, you know what, I should just move here, you know. So, um, so I moved here. Well, actually, my initial plan was to be a snowbird. I wanted to spend my summers in Chicago, my winters in LA. And so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I moved out here for the winter of 2012, going into 2013. Same rented the apartment that I live in now, and then went back to Chicago for that summer. And then when it came time to come back to LA, I was like, I don't even want to come back to Chicago after this. So I just ended up permanently moving out here. And I think uh, Valentine's Day 2014 is when I like officially settled in LA, so. Wow, yeah, we literally moved here. Exact. I moved here November 2012. Oh, wow, yeah. it's. it's I don't know. I feel like time has flown since I've been here. I don't know if it's just a factor of getting older or if there's a weird time phenomenon in LA. <laughs> I'm just, you can't keep track of it with, you know, just the way that the seasons work here and the weather, you know, so. Yeah, I do. I, I It sounds weird to complain about, but I do miss rain. Like I love rain and I love when it gets cloudy. I'm a Miami boy. I love when it rains during the summer and yes. we just get that so rarely here but at the same time living in a tropical climate and living in a cold one like Chicago it helped me to be like I'm never going to complain about the weather here because it's just never you cannot you cannot <laughs> and it's cold but it's never too cold it's and yeah it can be hot but it's like it's summer you know totally it's so freaking hot right now and of course this is like the like my AC is on the fritz right now so getting today was such like a nightmare just like everything to just stay in place <laughs> well it's also i also like to throw out the idea of like technically you don't have to be in drag but that's something that you choose to do as a politician which i think is so valuable and so important uh one of the things you were talking about in one of the podcasts that i heard uh was that you were it's just time it's something i complain to my family and my friends about a lot but it's really weird to believe that this country with the diversity that exists within it to have representation that is pretty much cisgender straight white old men yep and to have something that's so 
striking in a positive way, but like in a in a in an important way because so many voices. So you got into you got into politics to address a lot of issues, a lot of different issues such as homelessness, uh, mm -hmm. LGBTQ rights, uh, the fucked upness that is ICE and the private prison system, and these are all really really important things that I guess before I we kind of go off on the rails. There's just something that I really want to ask you yeah. because I just feel like it's super important and I'm struggling with it. But um, politics is such an important thing that we all have to understand, respect, and actively work at. How do we speak to other people, especially close ones that we love who just have completely different opinions and, and, and sometimes don't even want to talk about it because you shouldn't quote unquote talk about politics. Yeah, it's so interesting because like you just said, there's always, there's been that, um, you know, that faux pas of talking about politics and religion, which I think is such BS. Um, you know, religion holds people down and so does politics. And that's why people don't want you talking about them. And so, um, you know, I do think it's important to bring up, um, you know, political conversations because really it affects everybody. And I think for a long time, people felt very separated from um, their government, separated from the political world. When, when you really think about it, especially in this nation, the government should be the people. So the people should be having conversations about the government and how we would like to see it run. You know, the ideas that we want to see, um, the laws we want to see put in place, the laws that we want to see repealed. And not enough people are paying attention to that. And in some ways, I understand it because it can be really intimidating because it's such a broad, vast concept. It's like where to begin if I want to get, you know, interested in politics or activism or things like that. And um, but yeah, I think that it is really important to, to encourage people to vote. But at the same time, you know, voting is a privilege for a lot of people. And, um, you know, I think something to remember is that we all vote for different reasons. We all have particular values that we're wanting to see in our government. We're all having, um, and we all have different ideas. And I think that it's really important to listen to each other and understand where people are coming from when they vote and when, um, you know, where they're coming from, because we are always, you know, looking through our own point of view. Um, so this particular election is really tricky just because, you know, um, I think the, the main objective for a lot of people is getting Donald Trump out of office. And that's so important. I think a lot of people were disappointed this year also because the Democratic candidate is, you know, arguably one of the least exciting candidates, you know, to be enthusiastic about, you know, from the get go, there were so many great candidates in this particular election cycle. And, you know, the fact that we ended up getting Biden, I think is, it's not shocking, but it's disappointing. And, you know, um, I'm a Bernie Sanders fan. Um, I was a Bernie, you know, a Bernie sis, I guess. <laughs> and, um, you know, I was really disappointed that Bernie lost. But, you know, I do still plan on voting for um, for Biden and Harris, um, just because, you know, it's it's harm reduction. And it's, you know, I hate to engage in the lesser of two evil system. But, you know, that's unfortunately what we're stuck with at the moment. It's just so disappointing, because every single presidential cycle, we're always talking about, you know, picking the lesser of the two evils and talking about how this change in progress is going to come down the road and the change in progress needs to happen now. And so I'm not going to tell anybody that they have to vote for, for Biden Harris, you know, that's somebody's individual decision. Um, you know, just because I understand that everybody comes from a different place and, you know, either one of the two, you know, Biden or Trump might be harmful to particular, you know, groups of people, um, you know, particular minority groups. So, so yeah, so it's an interesting election and I'm kind of just staying a little bit mum about it. Um, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm going to vote for, for Biden and Harris and I hope other people do too, but I'm not officially, you know, endorsing right. them. So, right. and um, I do, I do, sorry. You're gonna... The other thing to consider is really, you know, if I understand why people don't want to vote because withholding your vote, it's, it, it disrupts, it, it has the opportunity to disrupt, disrupt the status quo. And, you know, we're going to continue to have this system where we always have to pick between the lesser of two evils. If we continue with the status quo and are just, you know, willing to give our vote to whoever the DNC puts in front of us. And so I get it. It's complicated. And, you know, I hope that the Democratic Party wins this year. And I hope that next time it's a progressive candidate.
was. Oh, we can, and that's the thing too. It's like, the, I remember being a child and hearing the idea of the three words, we, the people, and not understanding how we just don't really grasp that. Like we allow so many men to make decisions about women's genitalia and just even trans men's genitalia. Like just the idea of giving up on it is just something that I feel like I hear a lot recently giving up on the idea of change and and it's like there's always change like we're continuously changing and if we haven't if we can't see that there has been change this year alone and people have made just even the idea of like something as basic as aclu suing los angeles to lift the uh the the quarantine i said the um, the curfew that's something that people were dealing with months later and it's like if you are not actively trying to change it it's gonna do whatever the fuck it wants to do with you so i just i feel like especially just the fact that like as an art form drag and burlesque is so political that that's what attracted me to it and that's what it just felt like it was a little bit more digestible to to watch performance art dictating kind of your political views or just the political views of your your country or just whatever it is so i just I I'm a little bit lost in trying not to be emotional when I'm having discussions with people who, because as a Cuban, there are tons of Cubans who are Republican, who are anti-gay, anti-trans, anti-Black. And that's one of those things that I feel like as a, as a person who wants to change, but kind of is honestly scared of politics, like you said earlier, like I, it is overwhelming. I realized that there, it's just, it's for me impossible to not, for it to be something that I can't actively be talking about. So I'm trying to figure out ways. And I know a lot of other people are, uh, I posted like this random thing about how I was just like, if you're voting for Trump this year, let me know I'm ready to get petty. Cause I was ready to just cut shit off, cut people off because it's just one of those things where it's like, I'm not trying to fight you. I just don't want to include anyone in my life that believes that not everyone deserves rights. Absolutely, 100%. And I'm as, I'm in the same boat. I mean, you know, when I said, also, I should clarify, when I said earlier, I'm not going to tell you to vote for. Absolutely, right. vote for Trump. But, you know, if you feel that you want to vote for a third-party candidate, you know, it's not my place to say, no, don't do that. Um, it's not my place to educate people. It's my place to encourage people to educate themselves about the process and make an informed decision about who they want to vote for, what they think is best for themselves, their family, their community, you know? I love that. Yeah. Because I do believe that we get a lot more done with love, but at the same time, love can be different things. Like it can be where we can sometimes be separate. Sometimes we can work things out. And I do think as a just minorities and, and this country, it's really interesting to call the United States when we are a little bit further than United on yeah. so many important things. Absolutely. Um, my love, I'm not sure that that took a little bit of a, of a turn, but I did kind of want to talk about it because it's just something that I know that not only am I going through, but especially even when I posted that thing about Trump, I got a lot of Cuban American queer people who were just like, what do I do with my family? And it's like, I don't have that answer. I don't know what to do for myself. All I know is I can leave with love. And sometimes that means like, yeah, sweep them and you love them from a distance or what. Oh. But I do think that it's like very interesting to try to have political conversations right now because it's like so important. It's I don't it understand is not doing it Especially with your family and people that are in your close network. I do think it is it's important to have those difficult conversations about, you know, because I think that a lot of people who are Trump voters you know, I will say that I think that there's probably a lot of generally decent people that voted for Trump and, you know, don't realize how that vote impacts minority groups, um, you know, people of color, queer people, immigrants. And I think when you explain to, you know, especially somebody that's close to you, you know, this is how this impacts me and my community. This is how it impacts my neighbors and people just like me. Um, you know, I think it gives a different point of view. And I think that's why it is important to talk about politics, because, you know, it's easier to change somebody's mind and change somebody's heart when you come at it from a personal stance and with a personal story, rather than just, you got to do this, you have to do this, this is your only choice, without really backing it up as to why this is important. I love that so much. Thank you. Because that is, I mean, I think that's something we all, especially 
them holidays are going to creep up real soon, y'all. We're going to have to be sitting up November and December up with our families. So it's one of those things where it's like, how do we take care of ourselves mentally to continue protesting, to continue trying to enact the changes that we want to see in this country, which it like, my thing is, it's just like, we've come as far as we need to go. We have come a long way in the last 50 years. And it's just mind boggling to not want to kind of reach our full potential as a country, like, and just kind of love each other and just be respectful towards each other, I feel like is the biggest thing. Cause it's like, no, you don't under, I don't have to understand a lot of things, but I do have to respect it. And I do have to make sure that I act in accordance to saying that I respect it, not just say that I respect it. Totally. It's tough. I really appreciate that. On top of all of the things that you've been doing, because you almost won uh, the election last in March. Yes. And so, oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. You can, you're, you're about to go off, and I love when you talk, so you can <laughs> definitely... I was about to go right in there. Yeah, so we... Um, the uh, I ran in the primary election for the U.S. House of Representatives for California District 28 in the uh, 2020 primary election. And... You know, it was one of the most amazing experiences of my life, and I can't wait to jump in again. Um, to kind of backtrack a little bit, we talked about how I ran for, you know, I, I tried to run for mayor in Chicago back in 2012. Um, the reason I ended up deciding to run for Congress is because I was elected to a local position here. You know, you mentioned that I was on the Silver Lake Neighborhood Council. And, you know, when that happened, that was really inspiring for me, just because when I entered that election, um, you know, I didn't know if anybody would vote for me. I didn't know if anybody would vote for a person that looks like me. And, you know, when I say that, you know, earlier you mentioned that, you know, I, I do, you know, I do get up in my drags whenever I go to my meetings and things like that. But, you know, and also with a lot of the media attention that our campaign received, not only for um, my neighborhood council election, but also for the congressional election was the emphasis on me being a drag queen. And the near erasure of me being a trans person. So the story was always about me being a drag queen. And anytime I tried to talk about my trans identity with a lot of news sources and a lot of stories, you know, they kind of kept wanting to shift back to, okay, well, we want to see you get makeup and we want to see you do this. And, you know, it was very, you know, performative in many ways. And, you know, I think that it's so important not only to have queer representation in our government, but to have, you know, trans representation in our government. Um, I identify as uh, trans, non-binary, gender fluid, and, you know, a lot of, you know, there's been a lot of things that come with that, especially when you're trying to enter the world of politics. And so I was so grateful when my community elected me to the neighborhood council that I thought, I was like, well, why not, you know, dream big? Why not shoot for the stars? And I saw that there were no progressive Democrats running in District 28. So I decided to, to go for it. And we ended up doing an amazing job um Good. you know we ended up getting so there were eight people in the election and we ended up coming in third and the top two advanced to the general election so we missed coming in second place which would have advanced us by only 1114 votes it's for so close <laughs> it was insane yeah. and you know the gag was we actually got more than we got more than twenty thousand votes which the gag is my political hero is AOC and she won her she won her first election with 16,000 votes so technically I got more votes than AOC did in her first election which kind of blew my mind it blew my mind so um that's like, incredible it was it was such an interesting position to be in to lose but to lose by this much was so you know both frustrating and inspiring um you know it just went to show how, you know, a, you know, a, an amateur grassroots campaign can go so far against an establishment um, when you have people behind you, when you have people knocking on doors, when you have people fighting for things that, you know, we all care about, like Medicare for all, the Green New Deal, abolishing ICE, you know, basic human dignity ideas. And it's so funny that people label us as the radical left. And I don't think there's anything radical about wanting healthcare for all, about not wanting, you know, people in cages, about not wanting to destroy the environment. That's not radical. It's decent. It's compassionate. So um, I was, like I said, I was gagged that we did so well and, you know, also disappointed that we missed it by like just a hair. But, um, 
you know, I'm super excited because we're planning on, on running again um, for 2022. Um, we haven't made an official announcement yet, but, um, you know, exclusive. We're, we're planning on it. So, um, you know, I feel like the other, you know, the other gag about how well we did was we kind of entered the congressional race a little late in the game. Um, we entered, by the time we entered, I think the election was like, the campaign was about, I'm going to say around eight months or so. Um, and most people sort of start about a year out. Right. Um, so we were fighting against time and we were also fighting against money. You know, we ran a grassroots campaign. We didn't take any sort of corporate donations. And if you look at the, the numbers, the number one person, the incumbent, he raised more than $10 million in the primary election. The number two spot, who ended up being a Republican, raised more than $500,000. And our brand new amateur campaign, we only raised about $10,000 and we came this close from, you know, getting, you know, into the general election. So it was just really inspiring to see, you know, that people believe in these, you know, these progressive ideas and really want to see them happen. But there's so many barriers because the, the Democratic Party is so smothered and strangled by, you know, um, corporatism and lobbyists and, and people that are fighting for, you know, corporations instead of the people. So... The people. Yeah, so like I said, it was really inspiring, also frustrating, and um, you know we can't wait to to be in the race again. I know that it's only inspiring to all of us watching you because it's like it is so impactful to see people that we know and love creating these changes because it does it will take all of us to do this. It won't it, it cannot be just a few of us doing this. So I really, you know that when we were talking about signing up to vote, I was not in. Uh, the area that was able to vote for you, but my brother was, so he voted for you. And I was just so yes. excited about it because it was just like, my family's on the right side. We got this shit. Um, uh, thank you. Tell me I said, thank you. Some, I definitely, no, and I definitely said it back then because I was just like, thank you, I love you. Uh, one of the other things that you just mentioned really quick that I just want to say before we have a little bit of fun and kind of make it a little bit lighthearted is that I do notice that a lot of people do believe that if you take care of other people and it doesn't directly affect uh, benefit you that's a sign of weakness and that's just something that i personally want to kind of break down because it just i don't understand that and i've been hearing that a lot from just like people that just disagree with me and i i i i know that i'm from florida so i'm not saying my ass was perfect this whole time i've been problematic but i i can see where they're coming from and how wrong it is and how weird it is to even just hear it regurgitated in a way where it doesn't even make any fucking sense because we do need to be there for each other. How, like, that's the way every favorite country of mine works in a way where everyone is taking care of each other because they respect each other. And I love that. And I don't see how we can't do that. Care of each other. That's like, it's not a hard concept to grasp, you know? It really isn't. Uh, my love, my light. I do, I would love, I would love to talk to you anytime. I really do need to just have one guest per show. But, no, for sure. For sure. I do want to play a game with you. So do you want to play a game with me? I want to play. Okay, we're going to we're gonna try something different. This is totally like fun. I'm going to turn on the comments so people can fuck around and just try to help you. This is a game that I'm uh, taking from the internet called What Am I Saying? And it's basically just a gibberish generator. Okay. So we're going to get some political terms uh, on the screen. And then you are going to have 10 seconds to tell me what the words mean. Have you okay. played this before? So, no, I haven't. So basically, if it's like, if I want you to say, maybe a girl, I'm going to spell it in a way where it's going to be hard to just say it, you're going to have to sound it out loud in order to find what the secret phrase is. Okay. Okay. We're going to have fun. Don't worry. And you can get help from people in the fucking audience. So. <laughs> All right. Our first word is this one. Um, say it out. You can say it all out. Um... Led oh legislation <laughs> yeah legislation <laughs> okay I get it see, out of play. See, this is fun see this is fun you got this Scrambling. okay uh, like huh <laughs> <laughs> all right what about this word non-binary yes <laughs> yes non-binary <laughs> this is cute as fuck I'm into this all right here's our here's our third one that was easy town hall meeting. <laughs> I I could not find a generic one on the internet, so I just had to make my own. Okay, we got two more. 
Say that again. I said I love this. <laughs> uh, here we go. What about this word? What do you think this is? Silver lates. Silver lates. What does that sound like? Silver Lake. <laughs> Sil yeah, yeah. Silver Lake. Come yeah. on. Okay. Okay. I got it. Four yeah. for four. And this last one is not hard to read at all. It's just the message I want to leave everyone on. Tell the people. Wait, I... <laughs> Please vote! <laughs> yes! <laughs> Please vote. I love you so much. Thank you so much for joining us, maybe. You know, you're... It is great. You are such an inspiration. I love you. You also... Uh, we'll t we didn't even talk about how you produce a bunch of amazing shit, but since we're in a pandemic... Yeah. Like no, it's like why talk about it now? Let's wait until things start opening up again. But you know, uh, we do you have me back on the show when we make our official campaign announcement. Absolutely, and definitely when we get like an actual budget, and I'm like late night talk show with Jimmy Fallon ass realness. I would love for you anytime, anytime. You know, I love you so much. Oh, I love you too. I miss you so much. I miss like getting to see you on the weekend. So I know I miss you so <laughs> much. I cannot wait to see you. Hit me up anytime you want, and if you I want. If you want maybe a girl to be a president, throw some fucking hearts right now, because you know that would be the shit. <laughs> I love you. Have a great rest of your night. All right. Thanks, Tito. Bye. Bye. Oh, maybe a girl, y'all, for president. Yes, maybe a girl for president, y'all. I'm saying that is such a good idea. Oh, look at this beautiful. Just beautiful. Just beautiful. Uh, wow such a hard subject to talk about but so important and i really appreciate her so much for coming on and talking to us it's hot as fuck y'all right now so i am going to turn on the air conditioner as i bring on our next guest who is about to join us this person is one of my favorite people in los angeles as i said earlier i met them while i was on tour in new york in 2012 so she has had to put up with me for quite a while but her journey is just fucking amazing and it's super inspiring as well it really shows you how to just listen to your gut and go against what anyone's telling you if what your body is telling you to do is what you need to be doing you need to follow that fucking shit you need to follow your gut so uh without any further ado i am going to bring onto your screens she puts the girl in show girl give it up for christina nakaya Ooh. hello how are you gorgeous I'm sweaty. <laughs> Listen, you know, I love that. Look at your little graphic, girl. Aw, so cute. Uh, how are you? I love you so much. It's so nice to see you right now, oh, even virtually. So nice you too. Uh, I miss people. I don't miss I all do. the people, but I miss you. You know, And I'm going to say the same thing. I don't miss all of the people, but I definitely miss you. And you were actually the first person that I saw after quarantine. Yeah. And I got a little emotional because I'm Cuban. I do that. Mm -hmm. But I love you so much. And so right now you are in your very own studio, which I've been getting a lot of messages recently where people are like, so I hope they're hitting your ass up. But you own Fit and Bendy Studios in Los Angeles, California. And you are the shit. I've done a couple of performances. So if anyone's seen me with that brick background, this wonderful human being is the owner of that incredible studio. And y'all definitely need to go and hit her up and shoot some shit, you know? Live your life. Shoot some shit. We're trying really hard to hold on to this place through the pandemic, so. Yeah. And so it, it will definitely help. And plus, you're not gonna look any better in your apartment than you can look at Fit and Bendy, baby. Plus there's social distancing there. Yeah. I didn't even touch yeah, I'll you. I'll stand way over there with a the mask on. <laughs> I loved you and I didn't even touch you the whole time. It was fucking gag worthy. I, 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 I miss hugging. I can't wait. And you know me, I'm a fucking hugger. So I'm going to be respectful until I don't have to be anymore. Yeah. That sounds problematic. Uh, but I do want to get... That problematic, but I know what you mean. But, sh <laughs> you know, uh, I do want to talk about your journey in life because it's so inspirational. And it's something that, like, I, I feel like there are so many instances where we as human beings, and especially as artists, we are always met up with friction and just, like, force where it tells us maybe we shouldn't do this and maybe we shouldn't follow this path that my body's telling me that I should or my brain is telling me I should. And I just kind of want to tap into that and kind of figure out in certain moments in your life where what kind of motivated you to kind of step out of that box and just go after your shit because you did a lot of things that traditionally 
you shouldn't, oh, I hate saying it like that, but you shouldn't be doing. So if anything you don't want to talk about, I will totally, we could just, you know, like the drag queens doing the lies when they say, uh, talk about RuPaul drag uh, fracking and shit, and they just go, no, don't talk about that. You can always just be like, no. But I think, I think we're both open books. So I'm not gonna fuck around with you too much. But so you started out your life. Tell a little bit about what happened before you kind of went through uh, the first kind of injury in your life that you realized you had to get diagnosed. So like you were living your life just, you know, killing the game, just I dancing and... Well, I, I actually wasn't really dancing that much. I mean, I danced growing up, but um, like being a dancer was not something that my family thought was going to be a good career. And it wasn't it, that yeah, like being a performer, it was like, like which college are you going to go to? And like, you know, where are you going to go for grad school? And it's like, you know, like a lot of children of immigrants there's, you know, second generation, it's like, we're the ones who are going to make good all that work that the, the, our, you know, parents and grandparents did to set us up to have that, like, that, like, successful life. And um, so, like, there was a, a lot of academic pressure. Um, at the same time, <laughs> I just wasn't good at that. Um, <laughs> and, but I was really trying to make it work for the, the first part of my life. I, I tried. I did try. I will say this. I did try. Um, and um, around the age of 23, I found myself in college. I was also working as a stripper and as a sex worker. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I was in college and I was dealing with a lot of stuff, which later I, I, later I was diagnosed as, as um, bipolar but I didn't know it then so I was dealing with a lot of emotional stuff and I went through a really catastrophic near-death experience which is not something I want to get into details with now because it's, it's no worries. Too, too much but right. um, I, I, I got really in a bad place right and instead of having a trajectory of healing I didn't know how to, to take good care of myself at that time. And I didn't get a lot of great support from family in the medical profession. And so instead I, uh, I went into this downward spiral, which um, th over the years I've come to understand is basically a nervous system reaction to physical and emotional trauma where um, your body just doesn't have the resources to heal itself. And so that that spiral starts taking you down instead of up. Mm -hmm. And I ended up with what was eventually diagnosed as um, chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, which basically means like your nervous system is freaking out and we don't know what to do with you. Um, but I was disabled for most of my 20s. Um, I kind of like would get better for a little bit and then collapse again. I went for about a year of not being able to really get out of bed. Ooh, my phone's getting sleepy. Um, so uh, that really, you, you know what? I forgot to plug in my phone. Give me just a sec. No, you do your thing. Commercial break. Uh, Commercial. Trust me, y'all. There's song. a happy ending. This sounds <laughs> this sounds super dark right now, which is kind of the point. Yeah. So so it was very dark. It was really really dark point in my life where I really just didn't know if I was ever going to be functional again, um, and I was trying to figure out how I was going to exist in the world. Um, and the thing that the first step that I took towards healing was going to a take a dance class. And I couldn't make it through the warm up. Like I kept having to lie down. <laughs> yeah, but you went, you know, when I, when you told me that, I was like, I know that the fact that you went is amazing. Like. It really changed my life. It gave me so much joy. And the, the community of, of people that I found it, through dance and it, it was my first love. Like I, I wanted to be a dancer as a kid. I just didn't think that that was possible. So I, I got it. I got, got my yayas out as, uh, as a dancer in the clubs. But right. to like to think about dance in other ways as well, and other kinds of expression through dance, and to actually like really study dance and train dance was a whole new thing for me. But at that time, I was already 27, and it was like everyone's like, oh you're you're too old to be a dancer like that boat sailed like you know mm -hmm. and i just i couldn't accept that i mean at that point i 
I, I really realized like, I, I've come close to death a number of times already. And I can see how fragile my body is and my life is and fuck everything else. Fuck it all. Like, like I just like totally lost all my fucks for all those things that I thought I should do and was supposed to do. And like all those people who are like, no, you shouldn't do this. You can't do that. You're too old for this. You're too old for that. It's like, bah! no, yes. I, I need to find my joy or I am going to die. It felt that dire. It felt that. You like, should ask Jezebel Thunder how many, how I, how much we sound alike right now. Cause it's true. And, and even at 27, that's when I started doing shit because I was just kind of like, I'm going to, I'm gonna, I'm, I can't like, I, I have to follow this. And, and especially something like male burlesque where that doesn't really exist in the minds of 90% of the world. It's just kind of like a what moment. And I knew it was one of those like that, where you're just like, it, listening to y'all is not going to benefit me as much as trying. Yeah. So sorry, continue. I just, I love hearing yeah, this because boy. it's so, it's, it's, it's obviously you've gone through a lot more than I have. But I remember the first time we kind of talked about your journey, it just motivated me to keep doing so much because I am able bodied and I am able to do so much stuff that I don't want to take it for granted. So but that's just the, that's just the beginning. That's just the beginning of your 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 trajectory into the amazingness that you are even now. So I don't mean to interrupt. No, no, that's fine. Like I, I and I, I think that the thing is that like, so many of us who've chosen these non-traditional paths in life have stories like this, where, you know, the, we're supposed to be going down this path and we find ourselves incapable of staying. It's not like, oh, I, you know, I, I made this decision to do this other thing, or like, this seemed like really glamorous to go and do, no, no, burlesque isn't glamorous. No, sorry, everybody. Sorry, everyone. The curtain um, has been revealed. <laughs> yeah, whoosh, curtains pulled back. Um, so yeah, I mean, at the time I was, I was doing primarily like Middle Eastern dance and um, samba and I got really into, um, then I got really into like jazz and lyrical. I even got a little bit back into ballet, but not for performance. Um, and I was dancing, I ended up dancing for a living, um, which was, you know, tough, but again, so much better than the alternative of like the, I, I worked a real, real job as a magazine editor for two and a half months. I was the worst employee, the worst. I was so terrible. I'd like leave on lunch break and go to the gym to work out and then like be like cutting out early for dance class. So finally I was like, you know what? If this is my I passion, yeah. Or I don't care like if I have to like have 30 roommates, I'll figure it out. And, and you know, that's what we do, figure it out. And then um, at the age of 30, I um, <laughs> I saw a contortionist perform at Teatro Zanzani, her name's Vita Radionova. And I'd seen contortion before, but I had never seen a contortionist like her because she's got titties. She's like <laughs> sexy. And she came out, she did this contortion act and she had her hair up and then she took it down wet and she whipped it at the audience and sprayed the front row with water. And I was like, I saw her after the show and I was, I was with someone and they were like, go talk to her. And I was like, I was like a 12 year old. I was like, oh, hello, I just love her. You know, I freaked out. <laughs> Years later, I got to train with her wow. and we were in the same class together. And like, so I was like, oh, can you spot Vita? And I was like, like scared to touch You're her. You're like, I don't know if I can. Yeah, she scared me. Um, <laughs> but but she's, she's lovely. She's a lovely human. I just she inspired me so much. And I found out that there was this amazing woman who was coaching contortion in San Francisco, where I was living at the time. And she was teaching it. And I was like, what? People teach this? You can learn it? And I remember the first day of walking into Circus Center in San Francisco. And like, there are all these like, you know, teens to early 20s. And they're like doing over splits. And they're like, butts are on their heads. And they're just warming up by doing like these kicks where their legs are like, oh. And I was like, oh, my God, this is so terrifying. But the woman who's the coach, Serchma, who's now one of my best friends in the world, was like, come on in, you know? Like, you, do you feel like you want to try this? Like, you know, I'll, I'll coach you. And I was like, I'm old, I'm 30. She's like, oh, it's okay, you know what? I will coach you. And we became such close friends. And then she wanted to learn some dance. And we ended up doing this trade where she was coaching me and I was teaching her dance. And 
it was so hard. It was the hardest thing I'd ever done, but I loved it. I loved it. I tried to quit a couple of times because everyone in my life was like, you are an absolute maniac. Like, what are you thinking? I remember my stepbrother was like, what, you couldn't get any weirder? <laughs> and I was like, apparently. Apparently yeah. not, actually. Apparently but so, that's, also, um, that's, that's an art form that most people think young people are doing. Yeah, well, so I mean, when I first started it, it was. It was. Like, it was really unheard of for someone my age to be training in torsion. Um, to start at my age, you know? And even it's, with all the other, like, physical things as well, that's, like, yeah, so... Yeah, so I was dealing with the chronic fatigue and the fibromyalgia and the, the like, neurodivergence and, like, all the you other You fucking stuff. did it. And you fucking did it, though. I did do it. I did do it. I even went to Mongolia and trained there with some of the coaches, which was really hard on my body because they trained me in this very intense way. And they may have... They did. They, they, I, by the time I got back from that, I was pretty injured. Um, I'm also really hypermobile and with all the other stuff. So by the time I was 35, I was five years into it. And I had been working as a contortionist and performing. I never got really good. I mean, let's be real. Like I was never a super high level contortionist because of all this other stuff that I was trying to work through physically and emotionally at the same time, but I got okay. And by the time I was 35, though, I had multiple injuries. I have a complete tear of the rotator cuff in this hip. I have no ligaments in my right hip. I've dislocated most of my ribs, and I have arthritis in my right foot. Ah. <laughs> that lift, girl. <laughs> and I'm still performing. That's ah, the hottest part. Um, because you know how we are. We're like, the show must go on. But it really got bad. It got to the point where I, I did have to stop. And uh, again, everyone was like, Christina, you've had your run, you've had your fun. How about you like get married and have some babies? And, and you know, this guy proposed to me and I, he, you know, it was like one of those situations where it's like it, it, on paper, again, on paper, everything looked like it should line up. And I just started drinking really heavily. You're such a good <laughs> storyteller. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I love that I so much. I started drinking heavily. So again, it was like, okay, I need to, um, I need to make different decisions or I'm gonna like become a serious addict again. Um, and I started to rehabilitate myself. I, I started working with an amazing PT up in the Bay Area. And then I started learning Pilates. I got my Pilates certification and reading every book I could find on flexibility and anatomy and the way the body works and then starting to learn about neurology and. Um, and kinesiology and really kind of self-educated myself uh, and used these tools to get back to performing. And then I went back to performing contortion, which is when I moved to LA. And when I came into the picture. And when you came in and my whole life changed for the better because I knew Tito. <laughs> they were just getting you ready for when I was arriving so you could be your absolute best, which I mean, you are. You started not only contortion training with Fit and Bendy, the studio and the actual company. You have DVDs. You got some yep. Jane Fonda so as way DVDs. that I rehabilitated my body, I started teaching it because it seemed to work nicely for other people too. And all of a sudden I had a business. I'm what? not trying to clap loud in my apartment but it's honestly like it's it, there's so many stories where you are met with like a wall and it's like it, it's really kind of disheartening to have people that you love kind of be a part of that wall and it's just really inspiring to not only hear the different kinds of people that go through different situations that are similar but like you said every artist there's i don't i don't know many artists that haven't gone through that push and that like struggle. It's just a part of it. And I think that's the scariest part for people who are not artists is that they know it's gonna be tough and they don't want you to go through that. But it's like, what's the alternative? Because the other thing that you want me to do is tougher. Well, I, I someone, I, I'm just gonna massacre this quote and I don't know who said it, so. Anonymous. <laughs> yeah, someone said like the only reason to become, I think they're specifically saying writer, but I think this holds true for any kind of art. The only reason to become an artist is because you can't not. Mm, it's true. And I've thought that so many times, there have been so many times that I have tried to quit doing this crazy shit that we do. So many times and I can't. And yeah, I, don't, I think I don't... that any of us out there who are doing 
like our like and I another quote that I don't remember who said it, but I still love and remember is uh, someone saying like, "How do you know you're successful as an artist? You're making art. Mm. That's it. That's success." I would like to say that yes, that is true. But I would like some money in my pocket because I'm tired oh. of do just making a bunch of art for no money. But yeah. uh, but that's a part of the journey. And that's the thing about even just this year. I think this is the first time, especially as an artist, I feel mentally a little bit better than I thought I would be with a situation like this, because this is the first time that everyone is kind of going through that same thing together. And we as artists always kind of have this community because we know that it, it like we have we know Oscar winners that are still dog sitters, you know, like it's just that's a part of the game. And I think everyone sees like the glamour of everything. And it's like, we've been talking about that. It's just all facade, but people still look at it like it's this, oh my God thing. And it's like, no, it's work. And I would argue it's probably harder than your job because there's not really a, a, a nine to five. There's a, I have to do this at all times. If you're going to do it, you know, by yourself with no money. Yeah. Christina Nikaya, I hate that this fucking time goes by so fast. Um, it really does, doesn't it? But before we play the game, I do want to plug again that if anyone is in the Los Angeles community, there is a lot of performers that are on online shows right now. I love y'all. We are tired of seeing your apartments. So please go hit up Fit and Bendy. I'm telling you, it will elevate your game. You walk in that motherfucking big ass studio. She got cameras all set up, lights all set up. You can literally do the damn thing. Please support this incredible woman and this incredible studio because... I refuse to believe that this shit is going to be non-existent next year when we get back to life. Yeah, I should also say our, it's sliding scale per hour. So you pay what you can because we're all in this together. You literally won't get a better deal than that, Los Angeles. Like You literally cannot find me a better deal than that. So please support my girl, Christina Nakaya. Nick, uh, Christina, do you want to play a game? I love games. Okay, this I'm is bad at my them, but I enjoy it. Listen, so am I, but this is one of those games that I'm starting to realize the more I do it, the harder it is getting. This is sponsored in part by G's Louise, the honey badger of burlesque. This is, oh wait, that is what we just played. This is Name That Stripper. So I don't believe we've ever played this, but what's going to happen is I'm going to show you on the screen a visual, a mosaic visual of a burlesque performer. I'm saying stripper loosely, but it's burlesque performers for this one. Um... And you will be able to tell me who they are. You have all the people in the comments. Are these people I know? Absolutely. I'm not trying to, okay. this is just lighthearted fun. This is not trying to fuck you up too bad. So okay. uh, you also have people in the comments. So if you need help, just ask them. But we're going to try, I think, uh, a simple one. Let's see if, Christina, you can name this stripper. Is that Darlinda? No. Damn, that was supposed to be an easy one. I can give you a hint. Is it Indigo? No. <laughs> How am I supposed to tell who that is? It's like I, great green gloves and a blurry face. You, the funny thing is I always go to people who you're following, so I know you're following this person on Instagram. You're going to be like, damn, I knew that. I'm, you ready to give I'm up? following like 5,000 people who all take <laughs> off their clothes. <laughs> the thing is, this is a hard game. It's Isa LaVamp. The Zig Oh, field. it's easy. I know. How, I tried. There's just no way I could have told that. Listen, it's fine. Jessica, uh, Jezebel is on. Jezebel is on the fucking shit right now. So. Oh, uh, she, she got it. Oh, you're. Thank you. It's, okay, she, so next time I'm just gonna call on Jezebel to help. Here me. you go. Here you go. See if you can name this stripper. Is that midnight? <clears throat> yes, that is midnight martini. I knew you could do this. All right, all right, all right. Here we go. Here we go. Name that stripper. Is that Roxy? No, but they are uh, in our community, in our Los Angeles community. Oh, Los Angeles community. Um, I can give you one more hint. Yeah. Gray hair. Oh, oh, it's April. Yes, April showers. Look at her looking all cute. She about to hot, give birth. Hot, hot, hot. All right, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. We got two more. Name. Oh, fuck me. I'm supposed to do that, y'all. So I fucked that one up. That is Femme Appeal from New York. That is the oh, show man. that I saw. The show that we met on. That is yeah. the very show that we met on. So I fucked that up, but it's all right. Uh, that was a good moment to just mem uh, remember that. Okay, this is the last one 
Christina Nakaya. Let me make sure I hit the mosaic one. I'm so mad at myself. Name that stripper. Is that Jezebel? No, clo not close. Wow, that was the most racist thing I've said on the Tito Bonito show. <laughs> it is a black uh, burlesque icon. Are that he's showing me a blurry photo and I'm supposed to figure out who it is. Um, <laughs> New York. That's Dwayne New Park. York. Is, it, is it Poison Ivory? No, but no. closer. Is it Pearl? That is Pearl no. Noir. It's fucked up. It is? You, you did that it with is. her face blurred out, even on the regular one. Ah. Damn, you know what, Christina Nakaya? For as uh, shitty as that game was, you did pretty fucking amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> I'm like, for you guys all got to see me being like squinting at the, I'm making my ugly squinty face at the phone. Listen, if I had the budget that I will eventually have, then it'll be a lot smoother. I actually sometimes do this game where uh, I just put baby pictures, which I think is more fucked up. I love uh, that one. Doofus also in the comments wants to say, me and my partner love your workout videos. Christina? Oh, yay. Thank you. Uh, nice. And then, yeah, that's the time we have. I love you so much. I really appreciate you coming on and telling a little bit about your inspirational story. Y'all, please follow Christina Nakaya on her account, as well as Fit and Bendy. Please come out to the studio support. Even if you're not in the Los Angeles area, you could just Venmo Fit and Bendy like if your ass was doing it, or you could even support another artist that needs the studio space. You could, yeah. Um, or you could just say hi. That's, that's true too. Look, also Dufa says you a hottie. Listen, if, <laughs> that is an understatement. Uh, Christina Nakaya, anything else you would love to tell the people before you go? Uh, don't let other people tell you what you should and shouldn't do. Message! Meh. <laughs> That's a message if I've ever heard one. I literally we say... We are all our own sovereign beings. Christina, my, my words for the day to leave the show are don't listen to when people say you can't do something. Even when they are more advanced in your field than you are, most often it's because they couldn't do it. Damn, we are like that. Christina Nakai, I love you so much. Thank you for joining us on the Tito Bonito show. I will see you very soon, I'm sure. Uh, please support Fit and Bendy. Show some love to Christina. Bye. Bye. I love you. Oh. Show some love to Christina Nakaya. Please support Fit and Bendy. It's an incredible studio. And if you want to just get a little bit more flexible and strong, you should definitely check out Fit and Bendy DVDs. And, you know, send me some of those videos of y'all working out to Christina. And if they're not completely fucked up, then I will send them to her. Uh, I love you all so much for joining the show. That is everything. Next week, we have all of our guests coming up for the till September. So if you want to find out who's going to be on the show, you got to check out my OnlyFans. But next week, we have Natasha Estrada and Arise Wanzer. So I am very excited to catch up with those two. And as well as y'all, I love all of you. Can confirm her videos are badass. Yes, that is 110% true. So I love you all. Make good choices. Please vote. Uh, other than that, y'all, please, if you're in the San Diego area, come out to a socially distant show with the Ooh La La Review. I am hosting and performing alongside Carolina Sola and Donna Hood. We are having a limited seating outdoor experience. It is uh, masks, outdoors, socially distanced, seven feet away. So if you want to come out and, you know, just experience a little bit of the before times, you should check us out. We're there every Saturday at Ooh La La Dance Academy. Other than that, y'all, I love you. I mean it, but that is my time for the night. Have a great weekend. And it's a pandemic, so all the days are a weekend. I love y'all. Mean it. Bye.